tonight on Speed Week. We're going long only to find a shortcut. We're going outside to bring you the inside story. Speed Week comes full circle next. Hi everyone, welcome to Speed Week. I'm Bob Jenkins. We hope you're enjoying your holiday weekend. Much of the motorsports community is also taking a well-deserved weekend off, but we have a lot to bring you up to date on. And we begin with the re-emergence of Team Penske, and in particular, Allenzer Jr. The streets of Long Beach have been his stage for five wins and 11 races, and last Sunday he was ready to bat 500. At the start, full center Michael Andretti got the early jump as Paul Tracy, Allenzer Jr., and Gilles DeFerrin went three wide on the front stretch. DeFerrin and Andretti took the first turn side by side, but Andretti held the line, forcing DeFerrin to slow, allowing Tracy to move into second. Unser got by DeFerrin, but not without making contact with the wall. Unser kept charging and again made contact, sliding sideways while passing Tracy for second. The first caution was caused when DeFerrin and Tracy made contact, ending the race for both drivers. Unser took third from Andretti and regained the lead from Teo Fabi and Scott Pruitt, who pitted out of sequence from the leaders. Nearing the halfway mark, Andretti was able to get by Al on this pass, but overshot the turn and fell to sixth. Andretti came back again, but locked up the brakes in the same turn and finished the race in ninth. Unzer went on to win his sixth Long Beach Grand Prix in 12 tries. Second place finisher Scott Pruitt takes the points lead with 46, followed by Mauricio Gugelman. Unzer moves to third. Tracy falls to fourth, and Jacques Villeneuve and Bobby Rahal, who started his 200th IndyCar race, are tied for fifth. For Scott Pruitt, the seat atop the IndyCar point standings must be very satisfying. This week, Derek Daly brings us up to speed with Scott Pruitt. The resume of one of America's most versatile drivers reads like a who's who of motorsports. At age seven, Scott discovered go-karts. By age 21, he had captured 13 national titles and a world karting championship. Five years later, Pruitt began a dominance in sports cars and endurance racing by winning the 86 IMSA GTO crown and the 87 SCCA Trans Am title. By 1988, he was ready to try Indy cars. He gambled his entire life savings to get a drive at Long Beach, and his performance there led to a full-time drive the following season with the True Sports Made in America car. It was a disappointing year, but nothing like the battle Scott was about to fight. When the brake failed during a test session in Florida, Scott Pruitt was nearly crippled. Injuries to his back, feet, ankles and legs took years to heal. His zest for fitness and a supportive gathering of friends helped during his extensive rehabilitation. And it's here that Scott Pruitt would like to tell you the next chapter himself. It's the love for the sport. Um, it's the love. And it's really, I mean, it's just the love and a passion for what you do. I mean, it's your life choice that, that you've made. And uh, for me personally, uh, I mean, I remember a couple times when, when Trammell or, or Olby had come and said, hey, we'd like to get you a, uh, some psychiatric help to give you some counseling. And I said, no, I don't, I don't want that. I don't need it. I don't want it. Um, and they thought that was, you know, pretty remarkable because I just, I always held on to, um, you know, getting back racing. You know, that was the one thing that drove me. Um, and I didn't want to talk to people. I didn't want to have contact with people. I just want just leave me alone. I want to do my deal here. I just want to get myself back together. Um, uh, and that's what, you know, drove me so hard was, was the fact of, of wanting to get back and, and get racing again. Scott, fill us in on the difficult years after your accident between the years 1990 and 93. Actually, you know, a lot of people are thinking that, hey, this is, you know, Scott Pruitt's comeback from my accident. But that's not the case at all. You know, we saw a you know, bright career just, just getting started in 89. I want to continue on with that. Uh, coming in and, and doing Daytona 24-hour with Jaguar, which we should have won, and unfortunately we broke in the, in the wee hours um, um, before the end of the race. Coming back the next race, which was the IROC race at Daytona, which is probably my greatest race win ever, um, uh, and winning that at Daytona after my rehab. Going through 91, and, and even though we didn't have a lot of finishes, every race we qualified strong and we raced strong. 
Um, at the end of that season, uh, Chip Ganassi had, had offered me a contract to drive with them. Gallus had, had offered me a contract. Uh, at that point in time, you know, I really believed in, in Budweiser and the True Sports program and, and decided to stay on with that. And then really it was in 92 when everything went in the toilet. I mean, that was, that was when, when my career, w I'd, I'd say, went upside down and all of a sudden I got blamed for everything with the True Sports car and, and a lot of people just lost their um, value of Scott Pruitt as a race car driver. After the problems with True Sports, did you worry that you might have fallen off the career bandwagon? <laughs> Oh, yeah, desperately. Um, you know, I, actually, a lot of people had asked me, you know, do you feel bad that Ray Hall's taking over the program? I said, no, I actually, you know, I'm glad he did because I'm going to get an answer. You know, if he goes out and, and he w starts winning, um, you know, championships and races, then, you know, that answers my question about Scott Pruitt as a driver. You know, if he goes out and does bad with it, then that's also going to answer Scott Pruitt as a driver. So, you know, we all know how that turned out. Um, and then it was a matter of trying to, you know, pick back up the pieces and put things together and, and move ahead to the future. Do you consider this as your comeback year? I really consider last year as my comeback year. You know, putting everything together, signing the contract with Firestone and, and, and Patrick in late part of, of 93. Um, Firestone and Patrick letting me go out and, and continue racing, which I want to do, and putting a contract together with Chevrolet and Trans Am. You know, I was on a plane like every few days, and a lot of people don't. I don't think really realized what I did last year. You know, we won the Daytona 24 hour, won the Trans Am Championship, um, you know, did 10,000 miles of testing. I mean, I was on a plane like every two or three days going somewhere doing something, driving a race car. Last year was really, the, you know, the start of the comeback year. Now, this year is a comeback year for Scott Pruitt in IndyCar racing. But last year was when, you know, things really started happening. When did you know this team was for real? and it was going to be as good as it is, as quickly as it is? Um, I think the biggest, uh, the biggest feeling that I got that this was going to be good is when I tested at Indy last year. We tested in, I believe it was June or July. It was 95 degrees. It was windy. And we're out there running around at, at 217, 218, 219, and the car feels comfortable. And I'm having, for the first time at Indy, I was having fun. And it clicked in my head. I get it. I get it. You know, I understand why these guys have so much fun at Indy. I understand, you know, that we run high, they run low, they run inside, they run outside. You know, at that point in time, I finally got it. was finally Scott Pruitt had the opportunity to work with a great group of experienced engineers and mechanics who could give me a car that I could do these things with. I'd never had that before. Are you enjoying this season? Oh, I'm having a, <laughs> I'm having a great time. I mean, this has been the most fun I've had in many, many years uh, of racing. Um, we're having a lot of success and things are going very, very well. And I think, you know, a lot of people see Scott Pruitt as a focal point, but I'm just a part of the team here, you know. It takes that, that mix of getting all the right pieces together, getting the right team owner, um, getting the right sponsors, getting the right commitments, getting the right engineering staff, getting the right team manager. I mean, if you look at, you know, Jim McGee, Steve Newey, Pat Patrick, the guys working on the cars, um, they're the best. And I'm just a piece of that. And that's why we're having so much success right out of the box. They understand how to get the job done. The NASCAR Super Trucks by Craftsman made their ESPN debut last weekend on the 3 8 mile oval in Tucson, Arizona. And the event boasted 32 championships among its 30 starting drivers. Series points leader Mike Skinner put his Richard Childress own Chevrolet on the pole and battled side by side with NASCAR Winston Cup veteran Joe Rutman in the opening laps. Skinner's day came to an end though on a restart when he missed a shift and blew the motor. He finished 27. Two-time Winston West champion Bill Sedgwick led at the half collecting Gatorade's $1,000 bonus. But it was Ron Hornaday who dominated the second half of the event taking the lead on lap 104. P.J. Jones drove the race of his life, making up three laps after suffering a flat tire because of a broken valve stem. He finished a valiant second. Hornaday took the win, giving owner Teresa Earnhardt her first regular season NASCAR Super Truck victory, as well as the series points lead. 2,500 miles to the east, the NASCAR Winston Cup Series race at North Wilkesboro, North Carolina, made it an all-Earnhardt weekend. The phenomenal season of Jeff Gordon continued at the 5 8 mile oval. He captured his fourth pole in seven races and lined up beside Brett Bodine for the start of the 400-lap race. 
This incident, which began when Lake Speed and Dave Marcus touched, involved several cars and resulted in one of only three caution flags, allowing a new event speed record. Kyle Petty was not feeling well before the race began, and that combined with unseasonably hot weather resulted in his dropping out of the event with 26 laps to go. Greg Sachs was also treated for exhaustion. Steve Grissom had his best Winston Cup race ever, staying on the lead lap all day and finishing fifth. In the late going, Mark Martin tried to take the runner-up spot away from Gordon, but couldn't. They finished second and third as Dale Earnhardt cruised to an easy win, his first of the season. Dale lengthened his points lead over Sterling Marlin, who finished seventh. Jeff second moved him up one spot to third, while Martin dropped one position. Terry Labonte is fifth in points, but only 229 behind Earnhardt. Earnhardt's crew chief, Andy Petrie, was named the Western Auto Mechanic of the race. It was his 11th win since joining the GM Goodrich team, and he moved to fourth place in the season-long Western Auto standings. It's been an up-and-down week for Steve Kinzer. After failing to qualify for the last two Winston Cup races, Kinzer and car owner Kenny Bernstein announced on Monday that they had agreed mutually to part company. Thursday, Kinzer announced his return to the World of Outlaw series as an owner-driver with sponsorship from Quaker State. Kinzer will miss this weekend's Outlaw event at Eldora. Look for him to return at his hometown track in Bloomington, Indiana, next Friday night. Damon Hill took the victory in last weekend's Argentine Grand Prix, but the bigger news came on Thursday when Michael Schumacher and David Coulthard had their points given back from the first race of the year in Sao Paulo. Penalized for using an unapproved fuel supplied by the French company ELF, the FIA reversed their position, saying the race winner and runner-up should not have been excluded from the results. Car owners Benetton and Williams, however, were fined an additional $200,000 each, and their constructor points will not be reinstated. With the extra 10 points, Schumacher assumes the lead, followed by Hill and John Alacy. Coming up on Speed Week, a visit with IndyCar CEO Andrew Craig. Uh, we're here to stay, and I can assure you that, uh, that our, our vision of, of next year uh, has us very much at the center of IndyCar racing. Last week on Speed Week, we aired an interview with the owner of Phoenix International Raceway, Buddy Job, who told us his reasons for ending PIR's association with IndyCar to realign with the Indy Racing League. Well, this week, I had the opportunity to meet with IndyCar CEO and President Andrew Craig for his response and comments on other issues. Regarding Buddy Job's statement that he was the one that terminated the agreement between PIR and IndyCar, what is your version? We felt that really uh, it was time to bring the matter to a head. And on the 17th of October, uh, I contacted Buddy, and I, I also wrote to him on that day, and said, look, uh, clearly the relationship uh, has no future. Uh, let's, let's be clear about this. Let's terminate the relationship now, and let's devote our efforts to making sure we put on the, the best possible race uh, in 1995. So uh, Buddy's assertions that... Uh, somehow he was the one who, uh, who asked us to, to leave. Actually, not, re not really correct at all. We, we, we were the ones who, who, who made the move. Give us your version on this dispute regarding the race title sponsorship and the television sponsorship. Sure. Uh, th this is an issue about, uh, about which much has been said, uh, very little of it factually correct. Let, let me just, just set the record straight here. Uh, Slick 50 is a manufacturer of an excellent product. Pyrol is a manufacturer of excellent products, but there the similarity ends. Slick 50 manufacture an oil treatment. Pyrol manufacture principally brake fluids, some brake, brake uh, cleaning products, clutch fluids, and so forth. They are not competitors uh, in any shape or form. It's clearly stated in all of our contracts with all of our race promoters. In fact, with every other race promoter, the arrangement works very well. What most of them do is they, they uh, uh, they come to us, they acquire the, the TV rights, uh, title rights as well, package these together uh, with their own rights, and then sell them on to, to their title sponsor. It's an arrangement which works for virtually everybody on the series, and, and Buddy seems to be the only one who, uh, who, who can't come to, to grips with, with, uh, with, with, with how, how we handle this. What about Buddy's statement that IndyCar racing these days is a junior Formula One series? First of all, I'd like to make it very clear that IndyCar is and will always remain essentially North American race series. And at its core, it's always going to have a very strong group of American drivers. But we believe that actually one of the strengths of the series 
It's, this is where the best compete against the best. Uh, this is a level playing field that attracts drivers from all over the world simply because it's a great competition. We believe that actually that's what the American race fans want. They want to see the best of the best. They don't want to see second-rate uh, drivers from any country uh, sitting in, in an Indy car. Are negotiations still going on with Tony George and the IRL? If so, what is the status? We had uh, some discussions with Tony early in the year, uh, in February in fact, uh, where IndyCar put forward some, some thoughts uh, as to how we might be able to work together uh, for the future. And uh, uh, Tony and his group went away and they had a very careful look at these and they came back with some, some further thoughts of their own. And what, what has now become clear is that uh, neither side uh, is particularly comfortable with the other side's suggestions. Uh, so we have reached something of an impasse at this moment in time. What will be your recommendation, if any, to the car owners when the IRL races begin? Well, it remains to be seen if any IRL races are actually run. Uh, but that, that's a, uh, in, in our view, uh, is, is by no means a, a, a given. But putting that to, to one side, uh, we have no recommendation for our car owners. It, it, is, it is for our team owners to decide what they want to do. What will be the situation a year from now? Will there be two series? Will there be one? Well, one thing I can say for sure is that uh, championship order racing teams uh, will be here, right here, running a series. Um, we've had a very, very successful start to the 1995 PPG Indy Car World Series. Uh, excellent uh, f uh, spectator counts at every race. Uh, slightly improved TV ratings. Uh, much, much stronger. Uh, support from our sponsors for many of the promotional activities we're starting to run around the series. Uh, we're here to stay and I can assure you that, uh, that our, our vision of, of next year uh, has us very much at the center of IndyCar racing. Craig also told us that IndyCar and PPG are in discussions for continuance of the series sponsorship. And we'll be back with more Speed Week in just a moment. Welcome back to Speed Week. The streets of Long Beach also hosted round three of the Firestone Indy Light Series where one driver is on a hot streak. Here's Chris McClure. Thanks, Bob. Indy Light's current points leader, Greg Moore, earned his second pole of the season to lead the 25-car field. Moore stretched out into a comfortable lead, leaving behind the battle for second, third, and fourth. While in fourth, Nick Firestone's chance at a top finish disappeared when he spun trying to keep up the pace. The race's most serious moment came on lap 34 when both Mark Hotchkiss and Diego Guzman hit the outside tire wall. Then Guzman was rear-ended by Bo Barfield, pinning Barfield under Guzman's right rear tire. A lower look shows just how hard the impact was. Safety crews were able to lift the car off Barfield, and he exited the cockpit uninjured. After the restart, Robbie Buell got the momentum he needed as he passed David De Silva to take second. Claude Bourbonnais on board nose cam gave us this wild ride just five laps from the checker, hitting hard into the tires. He was okay, but is now 13th in the points. Moore's flag to flag win gives him a Long Beach trophy to go along with those from Miami and Phoenix, and a 20 point lead over Robbie Buell. For Speed Week, I'm Chris McClure. All right, thanks, Chris. In the Players Limited Toyota Atlantics race, David Empringham won his second of the year and holds a 10-point lead in the standings over Richie Hearn. It's time now to go short tracking with the best of the open wheel action around the country, and who better to give us the tour than ESPN Thunder's Larry and Gary show. Ventura promoter Jim Naylor, always concerned about having the best racing surface possible, watered the track extensively prior to the semi and that made things unpredictable for the feature. At the start, Tony Stewart, the third car on your screen, bicycled into turn one, causing quite a jam up in the middle of the pack. Fortunately, everyone was able to continue. Jay Drake, in his best showing so far with the Steve Lewis team, had the lead early, but was soon passed by veteran Jimmy Sills, a master at figuring out the quick way around this track. Meanwhile, the racing behind the leaders was intense. Following a late race restart, Billy Boat slowed leaving the blue car of defending Western States champion John Cooper no room to go except up and over the left side wheels of Dave Darlin. Cooper, who took a couple of tumbles, was okay and surely hopes the next time his luck will change. Perhaps the drive of the night was by Boat, who started 14th and challenged Stewart to second at the finish. Neither driver was able to chase down Sills. 
Well, I could tell by all the yellow flags it was a good night to be out in front and not back there in the traffic. But uh, yeah, this beast car, the uh, DuPont, Dave Calderwood car, worked great tonight. And uh, we're uh, overheating a little bit in the motor department. I was hoping that wouldn't have any make any problems with all the yellow flags. I was afraid it was going to create something, but uh, it, it made it to the end. The car ran great. Uh, Brayton Motors did a great job. Several drivers flew all night in order to compete the following day at the USAC Sprint Car Race at Salem Speedway in southern Indiana. Those included Thunderheads Dave Darlin and Tony Stewart, who finished second the night before at Ventura. And Mike Bliss, who ran as high as third in the NASCAR Super Truck Race at Tucson before retiring with mechanical troubles. The long trip Kenny Irwin had to make from LAX to Minneapolis, then from there to Indianapolis, and then an hour and a half by car to Salem didn't seem to affect him. During qualifying, he broke the late Rich Vogler's 1990 track record, driving a machine similar to the one Rapid Rich drove some five years ago. In the feature, Bill Rose and the white number six was leading entering traffic, with Stewart and Irwin right behind. Rose and Irwin went low, while Stewart went high and tried unsuccessfully to use his momentum to challenge for the lead. As he had done the week before at Winchester, Irwin showed patience and maturity. On the next lap, he went deep into the first corner to get underneath Rose and into the top spot. A few laps later, Stewart showed he had been watching carefully and executed the same maneuver that Irwin had done to take over the second spot. But Tony was never able to catch the number 69 car and his new Glenn Nibel machine slowed with broken gears in the rear end. Kenny notched the win, giving him back-to-back -back victories at both Salem and Winchester but it's defending sprint car champion Doug Coletta who holds the point lead. For Speed Week, I'm Larry Rice. And with more racing action, here's my Thunderhead colleague, Gary Lee. A couple of races we saw during the first week of Thunder spent Saturday at Manzanita Speedway. Ronnie Schumann in the black 27 started in the fifth spot, but by lap five passed the 94 SCRA Rookie of the Year, J.J. Yaley, for the lead. Flying Shoe had things pretty well in hand until near the end of the race. That's when Leland McSpadden in the red 50, the other Thunder competitor we were talking about, began to reel in Schumann. On lap 27, McSpadden caught his fellow Tempe Arizona resident in traffic and used the high groove to take the lead. Schumann battled back, but McSpadden held on to win his second straight SCRA feature at Manzanita and regained the points lead. For Speed Week, I'm Gary Lee. Thank you, Gary. Now here's a look at the CarQuest calendar with events coming up. your auto parts needs, you'll find it at CarQuest. Well, that's going to do it for tonight's show. We'll see you next Friday at 12.30 a.m. Eastern, 9.30 Pacific, with a special look inside the shops at Penske Racing. And we leave you tonight with some shutter speed, in-car camera style. Have a safe weekend. So long, everyone.